This is the Breaker.News podcast for the week of January 29th, 2023. I'm Bob Mackin, publisher of the Breaker.News and host of the Breaker.News podcast. Welcome to edition number 275. The Breaker is your source for news, opinion, and analysis about British Columbia issues, institutions, and influencers. Later, I'll tell you how you can support The Breaker. On this edition, headlines from the Pacific Rim and the Pacific Northwest. I award a virtual Nanaimo bar to a difference maker. The Big Deal feature. History will be made January 31st in British Columbia. For the next three years, adults will not be arrested for possessing small amounts of hard drugs. Will decriminalization help reduce or increase the number of addicts and overdose victims? Hear from Dr. Julian Summers of the Simon Fraser University Center for Applied Research in Mental Health and Addiction. But first, is it just me? Is it just me, or does the B.C. NDP government deserve a yellow card for being secretive about the costs of the 2026 FIFA World Cup? Last year, the NDP finally fessed up. It would cost B.C. taxpayers $240 million to $260 million to subsidize the world's richest sports organization, which puts on the world's most profitable mega event. B.C. Play Stadium is one of the 16 venues for the tournament in Canada, U.S., and Mexico. On January 27th, an update. The cost is now $230 million for Vancouver City Hall. It turns out City Hall was supposed to be on the hook for $115 million, but nobody told the public until the NDP did on January 27th. There are more costs for BC Place Stadium, but the NDP won't say what those are. So it's very likely that the total bill is way more than $260 million. When an event like this comes along, the temptation to spend money and renovate or expand existing infrastructure is irresistible for those who are addicted to other people's money. And they'll tell you it's a good use of your tax dollars. But is it really? Research by sports economist Victor Matheson, a professor at the College of the Holy Cross in Massachusetts, has consistently cautioned that mega-event promoters and industry lobbyists rely on input-output modeling in order to attract or defend public subsidies. In one of Matheson's reports, he says that he found that many large sporting events simply supplant rather than supplement the regular tourist economy. Quote, in other words, the economic impact of a mega-event may be large in a gross sense, but the net impact may be small. What do you think? Email Bob at TheBreaker.News. This is the Big Deal feature on the Breaker.News podcast. Since British Columbia declared a public health emergency in April 2016, more than 10,000 people have died from toxic drug overdoses. An average of five people lose their lives daily. A majority are male between the ages of 30 and 59. Beginning January 31st, a three-year exemption in British Columbia to federal drug laws. Adults will no longer be arrested for possessing 2.5 grams or less of hard drugs, such as heroin or cocaine. Advocates for safe supply and harm reduction say this doesn't go far enough. Advocates for recovery, who want to help people get off the drugs and live normal, healthy lives, say it's a move in the wrong direction. Joining me on the podcast is Simon Fraser University's Dr. Julian Summers, clinical psychologist with the Center for Applied Research in Mental Health and Addiction. Addicts are warehoused in aging downtown east side welfare hotels. Some are living in tent cities on Hastings Street or in Crab Park, generally third world conditions. Will this move towards decriminalization even just for three years have any positive impact on these situations? It, it isn't poised to have a positive impact. The way the way that we're, we've gone about it um, should, uh, in my view, um, um, lead to some concerns about not only uh, increased harms to people who are currently at risk, but the, the further distribution of risk um, through the population. And that is, that is principally and uh, straightforwardly related to the uh, resulting expansion 
of the um, sale and distribution of drugs. There's a story this week in Vancouver that uh, people who have access to the vending machines, who have legitimate access to the vending machines, have been taking their supply and yeah. selling it to uh, <laughs> suburban teenagers who want to come in and 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 dabble or test drugs. We we should be concerned about the, the many people who experience mental illnesses uh, such as schizophrenia or bipolar disorder alongside their addictions and who are made vulnerable to um, individuals who would um, have them get drugs from vending machines, hand them over. Um, and uh, similarly among sex workers who are already very often under uh, um, abusive controlling relationships, vending machines become another source of um, potential income. And, and what, what the public supply of addictive drugs also represents to many people who are living in truly desperate uh, circumstances is um, sometimes it is a source of the drugs that they're seeking, but in a great many times, it's a source of drugs that they can then sell in order to get things that they, that they would very much prefer, uh, other drugs. Um, that are not being dispensed, or other things that are necessities of life, food and 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 the like. Um, so th this is um, uh, placing uh, emphasis on the the role of substances when the addiction literature <clears throat> strongly demonstrates now over many years that the um, circumstances that people are living in, the ways that they're supported, are the main determinants of addiction. And um, so by this, the part that's most worrisome for me is the mindset behind this intervention is, is, is one um, held by people who are willing to ignore abject poverty, physical suffering associated with long-term homelessness and untreated mental illness, and prioritize a focus on the source of their drugs. It, 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 it really is, it, it is unique in the world. And um, the fact that we are, we're being told that decriminalization will result in the decriminalization of, of marginalized drug users. That, that's, that, that's what the text supporting this change um, uh, reads as. It's about, it's about decriminalizing the people. The, it, we've published that um, among people who are experiencing opioid addiction in BC, 15,000 people, possession, well, first of all, between them, they had been sentenced 70,000 times, five, five times on, on an average per person. Possession as an offense accounted for 3.8% of their sentences. The idea that removing it as an offense is going to make a significant impact on their lives is demonstrably kind of strange. Uh, most of their offenses involve forms of theft. Um, I'm back to the ways in which they are forced to survive. Um, and 10% are, are, are related to violent offenses. They are living in chaos and they are dealing with chaotic psychological experiences. So none of this should surprise us. What should surprise us is that our government is willing to ignore those things while trying to persuade the public that our tax dollars going toward an alternative supply, an additional supply of drugs to that population is going to result in some net benefit when no place on earth has shown that that's been done. Well, what have you learned so far about the experiment in the state of Oregon where they've moved towards decriminalization? The rule of thumb, Bob, um, in, 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 in any case that we would care to look at is that if we liberalize the make more available, whether it's through our, our messaging uh, um, and aimed at sort of changing perceptions or whether it's through changes in the law, um, the, um, if we increase, or if it's through the supply, if we increase the supply or overall um, availability of drugs and don't do anything else, harms go up. So just that's a, that's, that's a rule. And if we, um, the, that's so, that should be unimpressive. Anybody should think, well, yeah, that's right, because there's that much more likelihood of an infant getting exposed to a drug. There's that much more likelihood of a person who has an allergic reaction trying that drug, being exposed to it in, a, in, in, an, in an innocent meaning way or a curiosity-based way. So there's all these probabilities multiply. 
what we what we what we should be taking much greater heart from is the evidence showing that um, if we provide people with offers of assistance to improve basic aspects of their um, well-being, decent housing, support for uh, untreated mental illness, um, support regaining employment. Most of the people we've worked with, hundreds of people in long-term relationships, um, and they've been gracious and 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 cooperative. They, they're they're participating in this research to make a difference for for others, and uh, twenty five percent of them have been in parental foster care. These are the people deemed the air quotes hardest to house. The people who service providers in the downtown east side say they're worried about perishing. They're they're some of them are barred from their own services because of um, the, the 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 way that they present. But people in that group are, are willing, uh, are, are highly motivated to pursue things like reunification with their kids. Uh, 25, 23% have kids under age 18 that they're separated from. The, the wish to resume work, the wish to reintegrate, the wish to reestablish uh, relationships um, is, is profound and, and highly motivating. And I, I should add that the comparison between uh, what we're currently doing and what I'm describing has been done in randomized controlled trials in Vancouver, replicated in four other cities in Canada, four cities in France. This is this this is a huge, huge open like secret, and both interventions cost about the same. It it costs roughly fifty five thousand dollars a year for uh, to to uh, to taxpayers to support people. Uh, who have serious mental illnesses and addictions and who are um, living homeless in BC. That, and that's mostly crisis related uh, costs, including things like hospital stays and, and um, stays in prison. Um, so we can right the ship, dramatically reduce medical emergencies, dramatically reduce people's involvement in crime by providing them with something that they themselves say they very much want um, and when we've when we've studied it over multiple years it, it is it is truly life-changing for people they 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 had given up on the idea of being reconnected with their kid for years and now three years later two years later they're they're visiting and and, and they're repairing their relationship right it's it's that kind of change these are people on average in their late 30s right if you group everyone together so the decades of life ahead of them and we are simply, when we presented the uh, propo a formal proposal, fully budgeted formal proposal to Minister Eby and Mr. Malcolmson um, proposing to implement this in BC, they uh, a hard pass, silence. This was, this was done you know, in, in person and just silence, awkward. Um, we now know that what they were already committed to was a massive increase in spending to the SRO sector uh, with disproportionate amounts going to um, the agency run by the wife of the former CEO of BC Housing, right? So, but it's, it wasn't the, the, the um, a question of, of um, conflict that that caught the attention of the auditors. It was the fact that the procurement process was shoddy, and there were there were there were no documents related to well, what are we going to get for this, and how how will we measure the outcome so we know we got what we were expecting? None of that. And meanwhile, they're taking a hard pass on a fully budgeted proposal to replicate in other parts of BC an intervention that had been shown to be highly cost effective, but socially very impactful with people in the downtown east side. So not only that, but when we reminded senior government officials that we had the ability through an interministry database that we had built over about 20 years in collaboration with the people that we've done research with, um, we've, we've asked them for their consent to access these data, build this database, and over the years we've shown its utility, we proposed that, um, we, we should that the government should consider using this database to evaluate with people's consent the um, effectiveness of our spending um, on services designed to help people with mental illnesses and addictions exit homelessness. Because through all of the research that we've done, we have benchmarks of what's, achie what's, achie what's achievable, what we can attain with, with, uh, with people, for, for even for certain increments of, of, of financial investment. So um, let's use that and compare outcomes, build on strengths, address areas where we think we could do better. And one week later, SFU gets a letter out of the blue. Thank you for the last 20 years. Please destroy the database immediately. And in writing, confirm that you've sanitized the drives. 
thanks again. You know, I'm 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 summarizing, but the, but there's no question. So the letter, letters online, there's no question that it was a, a, an immediate order of destruction. And then the government is trying to say that oh well no, but this was foreseeable. No 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 no. There's there's the Ministry of Health, which is the lion's share of the data that we analyze, had already renewed the agreement. This you know bear in mind like a two decades long process. If they had correspondence before. In de demonstrating that this was foreseeable, it would be in the public domain. There is no correspondence to that effect at all. So out of the blue, all at once, after 20 years, and in the middle of what? A homelessness and addiction and mental, untreated mental illness crisis? That's the point in time when you decide this is when we can safely go without information about exactly those things. So it, it defies credulity, and it's part of what makes me concerned about what's going to happen after January 31st among people um, most affected by our neglect. My guest is Dr. Julian Summers of the Simon Fraser University Center for Applied Research in Mental Health and Addiction. I asked Dr. Summers about the different approaches to decriminalization of drugs in the state of Oregon and in Portugal and whether a made-in-BC model based on recovery could include a reborn river view. Wow, fabulous, Bob. The uh, Portugal, any extrapolations from Portugal, I think, need to be first just uh, um, uh, framed in an acknowledgement that, uh, that we are uh, extraordinarily different uh, socially places. Um, they are a, a place uh, with, with deep roots and um, cultural roots, I mean, and and we are uh, perhaps the place on earth with the shallowest roots um, in its human population, um, uh, excluding indigenous people, of course. Um, but but there are similarities. the The similarities that are that I think are most compelling are the fact that they had um, a, a, a a surge in uh, in the appearance of. Uh, open air drug scenes across Portugal, and also a surge in the numbers of fatalities, drug related fatalities, leading Europe. <clears throat> and um, so they they reached a point that is hopefully comparable to where we are in the sense that there was a sufficient sense of crisis that they developed a national strategy that is is a it's a it's a long read it's available in English online I, I recommend it to anyone who's interested um, first third or so is, is is dressing the law if we make any changes we are going to be impacting neighbors and international partners so it's very it's set up very thoughtfully but the very first part is super clear. This is, uh, they say, a reveille that must call all Portuguese citizens. It is principally about prevention. So even though they're dealing with fatalities and, and open air drug scene, the, the document is framed around prevention. This, this is primarily about prevention, but to get to prevention we're, and uh, use of drugs among young people, we're gonna need to first go through address, and address the challenges that we see all around us. And so they, they, um, they, they were not, as we are not, they were not making a big deal out of drug possession as an offense. Uh, the police were overwhelmed, as police are actually across Canada, um, in in uh, in terms of uh, the, the the burden on 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 them. Many first responders, actually all first responders. Sorry, I should just hasten to add that there are very serious impacts that are not being acknowledged and, and well addressed among first responders. Uh, but the uh, the main things back to Portugal. The main things that um, uh, are credited with the dramatic reduction in open air drug use and um, fatalities in Portugal are um, the resources that they put in place behind the scenes that enabled what they refer to throughout the document as social reintegration. They're, they that, that's real, that's their goal social reintegration so it kind of they 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 they're making a big assumption collectively which happens to be actually well supported by evidence but they're making the big assumption that if someone has serious drug problems is out on their own appears to be also be mentally ill they probably need um a uh, a long term plan that involves life in a community setting so, but uh, this is not actually a new set of ideas. When we deinstitutionalized, when we went from the Riverview of old to 
like like so many places um, to a, a community based idea. We didn't. This was in the sixties and seventies. We didn't do it saying we were going to build the airplane while we were flying. We already had evidence that community based care was superior for people. And all that's happened in the last 60 years is people like me and tons of others <laughs> have added to that literature and shown how uh, how the preferences of individuals and what is in their long term, um, the best we can do for them long term with, in, with serious mental illnesses is maximize the their ability to retain um, the relationships and activities in community settings that 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 motivate them as people, because when symptoms will change, um, and and we're learning more and more that symptoms of of, of very very serious uh, mental disorders, as as in terms of how we classify things, are are more far more changeable than we used to think. So this uh, this model that I that involve that implicates Riverview, um, that I think you know is worth considering, is. Um, uh, acknowledging the the history of Riverview and the center of excellence that it remains today, it, and for a much smaller number of, of people, but people who are in very very severe crisis, what it doesn't have for its relatively small capacity um, is uh, a uh, um, a proportionate uh, discharge network of resources, places for people to go. And so um, if we were to um, use the information we have available to us and look at where are the concentrations of people who are experiencing serious mental illnesses and addictions, who are repeatedly involved with police, uh, courts, and corrections, um, in and out of hospital, we've, we've, we've actually we've published this, like the, 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 the actual rates in BC on a community basis, but we, but, but um, if you know, if we had access to provincial data, we, it could be done on an updated in an updated way. But but th that already tells us where we should be locating services. What happens otherwise if people migrate? We've published this too. They move to places like the downtown east side, and it's and it's not. There's no part of the journey that appears to be positive for them. Everything gets worse. The number of days in hospital, number of admissions per year, number of convictions, all are going up, 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 and. And, and the, at the end of that, they're homeless in the downtown east side. So we need to be decentralizing these services that have been shown to be effective. And um, one thing we can borrow from Portugal is pairing decriminalization with making uh, drug possession an administrative offense so that police have, as the, and this is what happened in Portugal, police um, have the authority to um, intercede with individuals and um, uh, on drug related causes, they can they have the authority to take to take them to what are referred to as dissuasion commissions. Basically, it's a place that is there to try and make sure that the person doesn't wind up facing another police officer, right? Or and come back to the dissuasion commission. That's they just want to make they try to do themselves out of a job. So for for people that don't have a home. Like like many, um, they would it would be offering them um, home and, and support there, um, and the and the and the acceptance of support is 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 important. Um, but it, but it, it can be done with everyone. We you know everyone needs support, <laughs> and if we offer them if we offer people what they um, what they most want um, and need, um, uh, uh, we can build. An alliance, which is which is what has to happen, but um, they most people Portugal also made very large scale use of therapeutic communities, over sixty therapeutic communities. So they they had uh, places for people to go where they could live, where they could be members of communities, where where everyone is overcoming addictions, um, experiencing recovery from addictions. Often these are also um, uh, related to some form of, of work and vocational training um, with, a, with an eye toward um, uh, being able to carry that forward once, once the individual leaves, because it's, it's, it's time limited. But, if, but with all of that capacity at the outset, right? So imagine where we are right now and how, 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 how much BC doesn't have this kind of thing, right? So they had all of that. They, and they didn't need until around 2018 
to implement a single consumption site in Portugal. Consumption sites are mainly necessary in areas where we're going to, where, where, where society is prepared to um, accept for a sustained period of time that people will be using drugs and will be homeless or precariously housed. And then they need a consumption site. It's, it's one of the main drivers of, of an assessment of need for a consumption site. But if your plan involves uh, uh, c c considering housing, a, a basic human right, and something that's in everybody's best interest anyway, I mean, for everyone to be housed, right? If, you're, if your mindset is that, then um, we would procure um, with uh, landlords in the private sector. So it's a big shift, doesn't involve BC housing in the same way. And we would secure units in a dispersed way throughout neighborhoods where there's a demonstrable need. And a, a site like Riverview, which I, I, I believe with in partnership with um, the Coquitlam Band and, and, and uh, other reach key stakeholders there, I believe the plan has already been set to develop it as an ideal community, a model community. I think in that part of that model community should be reserving places for people who experience serious mental illnesses and, and need support. That hub of expertise that currently exists at, at Riverview can be the epicenter of not only the support that is provided to people living in, in the community um, on Riverview, but around the province. And also they can continue to serve the role that they currently play, which is the recipient of referrals from around the province, but, but now they'd be able to do it in a much more of a networked way and um, ensure that people are, are stepped up, stepped down in the level of intensity of support that they receive uh, in a way that actually has steps. So there's there are things that we can do uh, that have already been you know, demonstrated. The cost effectiveness uh, evidence is in. The blueprint remains there. And I mean, it hasn't got anywhere under under the current government, but the the, the plan wouldn't need to be r radically revised in order to take into account more recent evidence. Um, it's a relatively well established model, and it's time for us to get around to implementing it. So thanks again to Dr. Julian Summers for joining me on the Raker.News podcast. Thanks, Bob. And yeah, you're right. Stay tuned. For more information on Dr. Julian Summers and his research on mental health and addiction, go to summerspsych.com. That's S-O-M-E-R-S-P-S-Y-C-H dot com. News podcast for Around the Rim. We look at news headlines around the Pacific Rim. In the Taiwan news, former VP Chen Xinjin takes over as Taiwan Premier. Tsai administration reshuffles cabinet for final 500 days in office. Premier Su Cheng Cheng steps down after four years, making way for former Vice President Chen Xinjin to return to the executive yuan as Premier. Chen said he was initially hesitant to take up the duty when contacted by Tsai over the Lunar New Year holiday, noting that he was hoping to conclude his academic research and other personal business. But upon reflection, he was swayed by a sense of duty towards a democratic Taiwan. Four priorities include continued COVID pandemic measures, strengthening the social safety net, infrastructure, and promotion of core industries. In Kyoto News, Dentsu officials admit to Tokyo Olympic test event bid rigging. A former operations executive of the Tokyo Olympics is suspected of playing a lead role in the rigging, along with several Dentsu staff, some of whom were seconded to work for the Games. It is suspected that the rigging took place in connection with the 26 open bids held in 2018 for the rights to plan 56 test events. These were awarded to nine companies, including Dentsu and fellow ad giant Hakuhodo Inc., as well as a consortium. In Hong Kong Free Press, chief editor of Hong Kong magazine Exclusive Character reportedly missing in mainland China, Chen Ji Ming, Chief editor of Hong Kong magazine Exclusive Character has reportedly been missing in mainland China for over four months. Ming Pao visited Chen's company's registered address in Hong Kong and was told by a man at the address, who called his mother, that they could not get in touch with Chen either. According to Germany-based 
poet Yang Lian, Chen has been arrested in China. The poet later told U.S.-backed RFA that Chen's Weibo, a Chinese social media platform, had stopped updating last September 21st. That's Around the Rim on this edition of the Breaker.News podcast. Now it's time on the Breaker.News podcast for Cascadia Calling. We look at news headlines around the Pacific Northwest. In the Salem Statesman Review, scandal plagued Portland Timbers and Thorns hire new CEO Heather Davis. Davis, 46, served as CEO on an interim basis after club owner Merritt Paulson stepped away last fall. She is among five women in charge of team operations in MLS. The club has been criticized following alleged misconduct by former Thorns coach Paul Riley. Missteps were detailed in a pair of investigations into coach abuse by the NWSL and the U.S. Soccer Federation. The Timbers also were questioned over the resigning of former player Andy Polo after an alleged domestic violence incident. In the Spokane Spokesman Review, The perfect plane for the Pacific Northwest, Horizon Fly's last turboprop plane out of Spokane on Thursday evening. Horizon, which was acquired by Alaska Airlines in 1986, estimates it's carried more than 50 million Pacific Northwest commuters on the plane since its introduction in January 2001. Thursday marked exactly 22 years since the Q400 came into service. Horizon is retiring the aircraft as part of a transition to a newer jet model, the E-175, built by Brazilian airplane manufacturer Embraer. In the Victoria Times Colonist, Businessmen embroiled in Souk Harbour House legal battles to be deported. A deportation order was issued January 18th for Timothy Craig Durkin because of his involvement with a U.S. Ponzi scheme. On Tuesday, the B.C. Securities Commission announced Durkin had defrauded a would-be immigrant from China of $1 million by lying about ownership of the hotel. A decision on potential sanctions is scheduled for March 6th. That's Cascadia calling on this edition of the Breaker.News podcast. Nanaimo Bar, brought to you by Spruce Hill Contracting. Every week we end the Breaker.News podcast on a tasty note by awarding the goodness of a virtual Nanaimo Bar to people making a difference. A virtual version of the province's favorite dessert bar goes this week to... Librarians. This is Family Literacy Week in BC, and a special thank you to the librarians for their role in literacy. You can nominate someone for a virtual Nanaimo Bar. Send me an email to bob at thebreaker.news. Spruce Hill Contracting, custom homes and renovations. Find more information at sprucehill.ca. That's it for the Breaker.News podcast for the week of January 29th, 2023. I'm Bob Mackin. Thanks for joining me. Did you know that on the 29th of January in 1886, Carl Benz patented the first gasoline-powered automobile? Now you know. Send me your feedback. Send me your story ideas to bob at thebreaker.news. Bookmark thebreaker.news. You can also find us at thebreaker.ca. Sign up for the email newsletter and get updates to your inbox. For news as it happens, follow The Breaker News on Twitter and visit TheBreaker.News on Facebook. You can support The Breaker for as little as $2 a month. For more information, go to Patreon.com slash TheBreakerNews. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash TheBreakerNews. Until next week.